You know, there's this certain cultural perception that if you like books with pictures in them, you're not very smart. This is patently ridiculous. Illustrations are as much art as the prose, and stories are not inherently good or better because they're presented as just a block of text. Sometimes illustrations can really enhance the prose, and sometimes illustrations can take complete command of the book. And to that point, I really don't think Alvin Schwartz's scary stories to tell in the dark would be the literary horror touchstone that it is without the iconic, disturbing illustrations of Stephen Gamble. Inside these books are galleries of decayed flesh, dismembered body parts, incomprehensible monsters, and expressions of pure terror. Gamble's black and white illustrations, with their fuzzy lines and strange anatomy that seem to barely hold themselves together, evoke rot, figures given in to our inevitable entropy, dead things that refuse to die. It's something that even the most expensive Expensive zombie movies with the most state-of-the-art special effects and makeup can't emulate. Instead of some animalistic perversion of the natural order, the dead figures of Gamel have a knowing intelligence behind them. They know exactly what they are, and almost seem to revel in it. There's a lot of horror art out there, but I think the only person who challenges Gamel's specific style is manga artist Junji Ito. There's a similar focus on body horror and creeping evil, with Gamel focusing more on mold-like shading, and Ito focusing more on surreal bodily geometry. I am not someone easily scared by media, but both Gamel and Ito are exceptions. Their works unnerve me in a primal way, that instinct we develop as cavemen to avoid diseased corpses. But unlike Ito, Gamel's work is being proudly distributed to children. Picking up a Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark book from the public library was a personal challenge to me, to see if I could get through it without those illustrations threatening nightmares. They were unnerving, but they were also tempting, like I was in the presence of something taboo, morbid curiosity making me turn the pages. Death is always an extreme state for the living, but even more so as a child, a young person who hasn't entirely grasped the nature of their own mortality yet. I wanted to see the decay to understand the decay, inoculate myself from the decay. This is what drew me and a lot of young people to horror films and books, and it was for that reason that I, and I think a lot of 12 year olds with internet access, though it's not something easily admitted to, would search for images of real dead bodies and gore on the web. I was scared of death, and curious about death, and wondered what it looked like. These stories help children deal with reality by putting a face on what they're afraid of. The things children fear don't go away, just because they can't read about them. It's a tragic mistake to deprive a child of a book that will allow them to face and discuss the things that make them afraid. Repressing those fears only make them more afraid. The illustrations make scary stories to tell in the dark. In fact, I would argue they're the only reason the books ever got any notice. Alvin Schwartz was more of a journalist than a prose writer, with these books not being entirely original stories, but versions of both pre-existing folk tales and more modern urban legends. Taken as prose, these stories feel like they're missing something, a certain style, a certain flavor to be effectively creepy. It lacks a voice. These are horror stories spoken very matter-of-factly. In fact, in the first book, there's a story called The White Satin Evening Gown, where a poor girl rents a gown for a dance, only to die shortly after. The explanation about what happens feels less like a horror story and more like a clinical police report. The coroner found that she had been poisoned by embalming fluid. It had stopped her blood from flowing. There were traces of the fluid on her dress. He decided it had entered her skin when she perspired while she was dancing. The pawnbroker said he bought the dress from an undertaker's helper. It had been used in a funeral for another young woman, and the helper had stolen it just before she was buried. And that's how the story ends. No flourish, no final image to ruminate on and be disturbed by. I mean... I guess a guy stealing off of a corpse is a little disturbing, but it's talked about so matter-of-factly it could be something talked about at a dinner table with your parents. On the opposite page is Gamel's illustration, 
a shadowy phantom made up of black, almost cancerous sinew, half in the dress, shown here tattered, slowly disintegrating. It's on the complete opposite end of the spooky spectrum. Other stories have creepier imagery, but less of a sensible flow, like a story being made up on the fly by a three-year-old. And so the boy and his dog are in the spooky house, and there's a man's head in the chimney, and the head starts singing, Me tie do tie walker, and the dog starts singing back, Lynchy kinchy collie molly dingo dingo, and then the head fell out of the chimney, and everybody died. It comes off as goofy non sequitur nonsense. But that's if you're just reading the book. And you really shouldn't be just reading the book. Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark isn't a book of stories to scare you. It's a book of stories to internalize and tell your own friends in your own way. What I had forgotten in the decades since I last touched these books is that they're more like scary story instruction manuals than spooky story books you read like a Goosebumps book. Many of the stories have suggestions about when you're supposed to raise your voice, when you're supposed to get really quiet and then yell out a loud boo to startle the other seven-year-olds at the sleepover or the Cub Scouts around this campfire. There's sheet music. Some stories require props. Stories have alternate endings you can choose from. It's a guide in keeping the oral tradition of telling scary stories in a communal setting alive. That's why the actual prose on display is so dry. You're not meant to read it as a book or read it out loud to other people. It's not called scary stories to read in the dark. It's to tell in the dark. You are meant to memorize the story and flourish it with your own spin, as is inevitable with all forms of oral storytelling. Most scary stories are, of course, meant to be told. They are more scary that way. But how you tell them is important. As Mamillus knew, the best way is to speak softly so that your listeners lean forward to catch your words and to speak slowly so that your voice sounds scary. And the best time to tell these stories is at night, in the dark and in the gloom. It is easy for someone listening to imagine all sorts of strange and scary things. Oral storytelling was our most common method of storytelling prior to the printing press, and with the printing press, these performed works ran the risk of vanishing into the air. Schwartz's books provide two services to that end. One, it takes horror stories told through oral storytelling and preserves them in amber on the printed page. And two, it's to further encourage the act of oral storytelling in its most recognizable modern form, the scary story around the campfire. These books are much more academic texts than I remembered. Like, I had completely forgotten that there was an appendix and a bibliography in the back. Because why would seven-year-old me care about the farmers in Kentucky that Schwartz cites when these images are staring back at me? And I wonder if those illustrations are actually harming the point of the book. On one hand, Gamel's illustrations are the reason the books are popular at all, I think. Without that grotesque imagery, the dry, academic text would not have attracted nearly the same size of audience. Alvin Schwartz wrote a lot of books of this kind, books of folk poetry and rhymes and tall tales and riddles, and none of them reached the same height of popularity. Even in A Dark Dark Room and Other Scary Stories, Schwartz's other horror book written outside of the Scary Stories brand hasn't caught the imagination anywhere near this level because it lacks Gamel's signature works. Nothing against Dirk Zimmer, but, well, he wasn't making this. I actually read In a Dark Dark Room as a kid, but unlike my time reading the Scary Stories books, it went through me completely. I only remembered it when researching for this video. But Gamel's work is so unsettling and so fantastical that I can't help but feel it overrides everything the book was trying to accomplish. From my personal perspective, my relationships with these books are 90% looking at this gallery of the macabre, and what few stories I absorbed, which upon rereading I discovered was not as many as I had thought, I absorbed them because of their corresponding illustrations. 
The illustrations, which caught the attention of young horror fans and conservative book banners alike, allowed the books a level of popularity and notoriety, while at the same time obfuscating the book's actual intents. That is, I'm sure, not a universal experience, and it seems maybe a flavor of the book's folk literature has bled into this year's film adaptation, though I can't speak to that, I haven't seen it yet, and it's not available for home viewing as of this recording. But even that film feels mostly concerned with bringing Gamel's vision to light. Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark will probably be with us for a long time to come, which is the best case scenario for a series of books about preserving folk legend, but that purpose will almost certainly never take center stage. Obviously, Gamel's illustrations are works of art and should be shared with those who can stomach them, but they outclass the horror in the printed page so much that you effectively have two books in one, an art book and an academic book, sharing page space, fighting for dominance, with one being the clear victor. But then again, it's kind of lucky it worked out that way. Many works never find an audience. Even the printed word, while more permanent than oral histories and storytelling, are not immune to the weathering of time. And those books that don't hold your attention are bound to be forgotten. And that which is forgotten isn't preserved, and will decay into dust and pulp and rotted leather with time. Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark is a lot like the ghoulish imagery inside it. Something possessed, something darker than its purpose that will keep it alive long after its contemporaries have died and been buried and forgotten. Maybe that's why these things are always smiling.